Okay, 12 smartphone fails. Starting off bad, but ending terribly. Let's do this. So if you haven't already heard, the Escobar company made a smartphone. And some claims were made that Apple was ripping people off, that Samsung was about to be finished, and that Escobar was the solution. As things turned out, the company basically took a Samsung phone, put an Escobar sticker over it, and sent it only to reviewers. In my first video about this, I basically said I'd need to wait and see if other people's orders got delivered before I could even think about recommending this. And those orders didn't get delivered, so stay clear. I'm giving this one a 2 out of 10 fail rating. Number 11 is the Meizu Zero. You might remember this one doing the rounds last year. It was being marketed as world's first holeless smartphone. So that means no USB-C port, no buttons, no speaker, and definitely no headphone jack. As a concept, I can kind of see the appeal. You get a completely seamless phone, and because the buttons are all virtual, you can use it in any orientation. But, well, for starters, I think portless sounds way better than holeless, and holeless isn't even technically true. The phone did still have microphones on it. But this wasn't the issue. Think about when you go and buy a smartphone. You've probably got a list of priorities in your head. You want it to have a great camera for photos, a great display for watching videos, and a great battery to last you through the day. I don't think I've ever in my life thought, you know what I hate? Buttons. The phone doesn't solve a problem people actually have, and while holeless is definitely the direction phones will start heading in, being holeless in itself is not a selling point. As a result, the phone didn't hit its crowdfunding goal, and it just disappeared. So, 2 out of 10 fail again for this one. Now, the name Phone Blocks might not ring a bell, but the image of it probably will. There's a guy called Dave Hackins. He made a YouTube video a while back talking about how smartphones are not built to last, but also how he'd come up with a solution. A modular phone where you could A, customize your phone with the features that mattered to you, B, replace individual parts if they break instead of replacing the whole phone, and C, when you need or want an upgrade, you could just upgrade the bits you want to upgrade. Again, not the whole thing. This sounds like a dream, and people clearly thought so. The video's on like 20 million views right now, but it somehow silently disappeared because of one major issue. The concept makes complete sense from a sustainability angle. You could massively reduce the amount of waste if instead of dumping your phone when you're done with it, you could just replace one part. But it doesn't make sense from a profit perspective. Phone blocks themselves, I mean, it was just one person. They don't have the capacity to build the phone themselves. And if you think about companies like Samsung and Huawei, they're not going to want to be in a mile radius of this idea because it would wipe out their entire existing business model. Plus, as much as I think modular phones are cool, it's riddled with some quite fundamental problems. Like the fact that for an average user, you're better off letting a company decide what's important for you and just buying a pre-built phone, as opposed to sitting there trying to pick parts that you think will be better. And for this whole idea of a modular phone to work, every single component has to be manufactured and put into its own casing separately so that people can chop and change them. But this makes everything thicker and a hell of a lot more expensive. Fail rating 2 out of 10. Saved in part because again, this was an idea, not a physical product that was made and then flopped. A lot of these products gone wrong, they tend to be Android phones because they're more experimental. But that's not to say that Apple doesn't make mistakes too. So you know how nowadays you can either get a top-end iPhone 11 Pro for $999 or a significantly more affordable iPhone 11 for $300 less. And the main thing you lose is just display quality. Considering that it is a $300 saving, you actually get quite a comparable experience. But this wasn't always the case. Do you remember the first time that Apple tried to make an affordable iPhone? Alongside the 5S, they experimented with a phone called the 5C and it was terrible value in comparison. For starters, you only saved $100, and for that you got given a plastic build, you got a year-old chipset, a much worse camera system, and no Touch ID. People still bought it, obviously, it's an iPhone, but I don't think it did any good to Apple's brand image. And if they pulled a move like that in today's smartphone market, I think it would get slaughtered. So this one's a 3 out of 10 fail. The phone still sold well, but it was a sting to Apple's brand reputation, and that is almost everything to them. Right, you might remember a phone called the Xperia Play. It came out in Android's infancy, and I won't lie to you, had I been able to afford it at the time, I would have bought it in a heartbeat. It was PlayStation certified. It had a proper controller built inside of it. This was really the first true gaming smartphone. That's huge. But there's a cost to being first. And in this case, it was the fact that Android as an operating system was just not ready for a gaming phone. And because there was nothing else like the Xperia Play out there, almost nobody had made any games that could even use the phone's physical controls. So you'd be dropping $600 on this phone, which had 
all sorts of compromises, like its ludicrous thickness. And the only benefit to you is that you could play a couple of emulators, a couple of cheaply made Android games, and some PlayStation 1 classics that Sony had ported over. But it's not great. But this one gets a 3 out of 10 fail. Now, for a phone that in itself was pretty forgettable, but I remember it distinctly because it's one of the worst cases of deceptive smartphone marketing to the point where they basically lied. So it's 2018 and Lenovo has been losing relevance for a while at this stage, but they were about to launch their next generation Z5 smartphone. So I'm guessing internally they were sort of thinking, how do we re-engage people with our brand? What they came up with was make a load of teasers that are just ridiculous to try and get people talking about them. So before the reveal of the phone, we got this image. And in 2018, this was very exciting. They started teasing 45 day battery life and four terabytes of storage. People were losing their minds. And because of all this, I actually tuned into the live stream too, and I wouldn't have done this otherwise, so it, maybe I got played too. But 10 minutes into it, I was cracking up. So that teaser image we got, if you duplicated it and flipped it, this is the phone they should have delivered. This is what we actually got. The image is referring to a phone that ended up being something completely different that didn't come out till five months later. But what about the four terabytes of storage? It turns out that was just for a hard drive they were releasing alongside the Z5. And the 45 day battery life was for a watch. And they didn't even deliver on that. It definitely lost the company a lot of respect in the tech community. I remember top comments on videos at the time were just lie novo. It's not great. So four out of 10 fail here. Now, there's a reasonable chance you've heard of a company called Nextbit. Not really a smartphone company, but a smartphone technology company. So for example, they built a service called Button where I could start something on one phone, let's say start editing a photo or playing a game, and then I could put it down, pick up a different device and continue where I left off. So you can probably imagine that when a company with this kind of mobile tech specialty announces a revolutionary cloud-based smartphone called the Nextbit Robin, that's pretty hype-worthy, especially when they're promising practically unlimited storage. The Robin had 32 gigs of internal storage, which was fairly normal at the time, but the twist was that as your space starts to run out, your stuff would automatically be backed up to the 100 gigs of free cloud storage you got with the phone. And credit where due, this system worked pretty well. The main concern with a small Small company trying big things like this is usually that the execution will suck, but it didn't. For example, your photos, they'd be backed up to the cloud in their full original quality, but your phone would also keep lower quality versions locally, so it wouldn't feel like you just lost files. But the one weird thing was that the phone would also send your apps to the cloud. And what that meant really was that they'd become these grayed out icons that could only be used once you'd reinstalled them. And unless you set your apps up manually to not disappear, the phone would do this automatically. So you could find yourself in situations where you'll open your phone, about to go into an app, and you'll realize it's not there anymore. It's a bit like those times when you were a kid growing up and you go into your room and your parents have cleaned the whole thing. And obviously they had the right intention, but all of a sudden you don't know where all your stuff is. This was an annoying inconvenience, but it wasn't the crux of it. See, the next bit Robin was trying to solve a problem that didn't really exist, thanks to the existence of a micro SD card. Instead of paying $400 for a phone that wasn't very good but could store a lot of stuff, you could just buy an actually good phone and then spend $20 to get an external 64 gigabyte card. That would have been plenty for most people. So again, four out of 10 fail, pretty major miscalculation here. But okay, number five, we're getting into pretty serious territory here. Let me set the scene. It's 2010, Apple's iPhones have just flattened the likes of Nokia and Blackberry, but now it was Microsoft's turn to fight. And their answer to all this were the Kin smartphones, which they described as a revolution. The phones came presented in a capsule. The slogan was, this changes things. And all the adverts were basically saying it could help you connect with people better than the iPhone ever could. What makes this one really funny then is that these phones were discontinued within six weeks of being announced. Six weeks, 42 days. It really makes you wonder how they did this. Even the terrible smartphones nowadays, they usually last about a year or so before they eventually get cancelled six weeks. These Kin phones, they were so bad that after trying to sell them as smartphones and failing, Microsoft then re-released them a few months later as basic feature phones. But how can a phone from a company as big as Microsoft, who's put so many resources into this, fail so monumentally? I can summarize in six words. No apps, priced like an iPhone. I've got no idea in what parallel universe Microsoft was putting this together in, but there's no way an average user was going to pick what they produced over an iPhone 3GS. Some reports are saying that as few as 500 devices were sold. That is, and I don't use this word lightly, 
abysmal. So six out of 10 fail right here. Now, you might already be fairly familiar with the controversy surrounding Samsung's Exynos these last few months. Basically, Samsung makes two versions of most of their flagship phones, and the Exynos version for the last few years has lagged behind the Snapdragon version. But this year was the first time that I've used both side by side, and Exynos is as much as 20% worse in both battery and performance. So I made a video talking all about it, and I couldn't believe the response. The comments were full of people who'd noticed these kinds of issues over the years. It ended up all over Reddit, and because of this video and a couple of other posts people had made, a petition started, demanding that Samsung scrap their inferior Exynos chips in the future. I was shocked. It's on nearly 50,000 signatures. 50,000 might not sound like a lot, but you gotta remember that the kinds of people that will be signing this, not to generalize, but they're more than likely going to be the tech people within their own circles, their own families and friends, the person that everyone asks which phone to buy when they want to buy one. So the actual influence of those 50,000 people, I think is many, many times that. As things stand now, Samsung's got two options. They either step up their game massively for the next Exynos, or they scrap the Exynos version entirely. Because if they get it wrong again, people are ready and waiting to just rip them apart for it. So six out of 10 for this one. It doesn't sound as severe as what happened to Microsoft's kin, but you gotta remember that Samsung's got much more skin in the game. They've got more to lose in the smartphone market than Microsoft did. And also if they don't handle the situation right, could be bad. Speaking of Microsoft though, I would say that Kin wasn't actually their biggest failure. In 2017, Microsoft announced their Windows Phone operating system was officially dead. But honestly, Windows Phone died a long time before that. What actually makes this so much of a fail though is that when it came out, Windows Phone was so promising. You got a radically different aesthetic to anything out there at the time. It was faster and lighter feeling than a lot of the bloated Android phones we were getting. Not to mention the Windows brand carries enormous power when it comes to operating systems. This genuinely could have been the third big player that we've always wanted in this iOS Android battle. But if you've ever used a Windows phone, you'll know that there was an app problem. Windows Phone had a woeful selection of apps to choose from. And by that, I don't mean you're missing out on a couple of hidden gems. For the first three years, there wasn't even an Instagram. And because of a disagreement with Google, YouTube support pretty much dropped off a cliff. And I am literally scraping the surface here. But there's also the fact that Microsoft was late. They arrived at a time when Apple had built a really strong reputation for just offering the best smartphone experience. And Google was offering very good smartphone experiences, but with loads of choice. You could get a budget Android phone, you could get an Android phone with a big screen and so on. But by being late, Windows Phone had to bring something equivalent to the table. Otherwise, you're just left with a bunch of niche pioneers who are willing to take a risk on something new. What I think they should have done, to be honest, is subsidized Windows phones. Like, there's no way you can just drop a new operating system and expect it to beat OSs that have been going for three years already. But you could have been cheaper, and that would have been enough. As things stand, they didn't do this, and Windows Phone OS was dead within two years. But Microsoft spent the next five years effectively flogging a dead horse, and it was painful to watch. So seven out of 10 for this one. Just as bad though was Nokia. In 2007, if someone had a phone, there was a 50% chance it was a Nokia. How do you just go from that to dying? How do you go from Titan to tiny, from big deal to getting no deals, from a Finnish company to a finished company. It's actually, unfortunately, simple. Do you remember the old days when phones could be anything? Some of them would flip, some of them would slide, there were all sorts of screen types and sizes. The point is that people used to pick their phone almost purely based on its hardware. Maybe they liked the color or the keys felt nice. In this battle, Nokia was outstanding. Their phones were affordable, they were customizable, and they had the kind of durability that people still talk about 20 years later. But what Nokia missed was that the second that iPhone was announced, in 2007, the battle shifted from being about hardware to being about software. All these other things, the way the phone looks, how well you can customize it, the fact that you could probably drop one of these and break the floor instead, these faded away in importance, replaced by just having access to the best apps. And that was it. Nokia barely even did anything wrong, they just didn't act. They kept releasing their trusty old phones for a few years and their market share just evaporated. So seven out of 10 fail here. Disastrous consequences, but it's saved slightly by the fact that it's not really because Nokia did anything particularly stupid, it's just that they severely, severely underestimated the iPhone and the impact it would have. Okay, just before I get to number one, I should let you know that I have got two other episodes in this series. So last time I made one of these, I got loads of comments like, 
Oh, you forgot the Galaxy Note 7. Nope, it's in one of the other ones. Do check them out after this. Okay. Let's talk about Sony. They now sell a tenth of the phones that they did in 2014. And while that's technically less of a fail than Nokia, the decisions that Sony have made are far more confusing. Just poor decisions stacked on top of really strange, bad ideas. It's like a really distasteful dessert. And I don't normally vent at smartphone companies, but Sony deserves this one. So for starters, the naming system. The way Sony names their smartphones is borderline criminal. Just have a listen to some of these past names of Sony flagships. They went from Xperia X10 to Xperia S to Xperia T to Xperia Z. So it already sounds like they're just picking random letters from the alphabet, but it gets so much worse. They then go to Z1, Z2, Z3, Z3+, Z5, and just when it looks like they might have figured out what they're doing, don't be silly, it's X, Z now. It is almost as if Sony's playing some kind of strange game with their customers. Like, they'll never guess what we call the next one. But okay, they do X, Z for a bit. And if you thought they'd stop there, well, you should know better by now. Xperia 1. With the next phone, they went all the way back to just calling it the Xperia 1. You might think then, how can it possibly get worse than this? And I'll admit, I think even if I tried, I couldn't have done what Sony have just done. They call their next smartphone the Sony Xperia 1 2. Imagine this scenario. Hey man, how you doing? That phone looks great, which one is it? Oh, this. Um, this is the new Xperia 1. Yeah, cool. So, the Xperia 2? No, it's the 1 2. Oh, okay. So the Xperia 12? Not really, it's more like a 1 plus a 2 at the end. So a 3? It's complicated. Okay, well, it looks kind of expensive. What if I just buy the Xperia 1 1? Oh no, there isn't a 1 1, there's just a 1. But naming aside, part of the reason Sony phones just fell into irrelevance is that they found something that worked in the Xperia Z. This was their 2013 flagship when they were actually doing quite well. And instead of innovating and improving on it, they basically released an almost identical looking phone for the next four years. You can't do that in a market where bezels are shrinking every year and Samsung's out there bending screens round corners. By 2017, Sony was looking unbelievably outdated. Not to mention people were just bored. If I owned an Xperia Z and I was due for an upgrade, would I pay full price for a phone that looks almost exactly the same, or would I turn to another company? But this was only part of the problem. Cameras. Sony phones had generally good camera hardware, but they did not take the best photos or videos. Far from it. And when you factor in that A, Sony's one of the few smartphone makers that also makes cinema quality cameras, and that B, Sony actually builds the camera sensors inside almost every phone, it's laughable. If anyone should have the best smartphone camera system, it is Sony. And that is all they needed to do. If Sony had built a reputation for just having the best camera systems on a phone, that alone occupies one of the biggest niches out there right now. People who really care about photos. But to be honest, this Sony problem, it extends beyond the phones themselves. Even the company's PR strategy is just not very good. Take the Xperia 1 last year. The phone was announced in May 2019. When did I get the phone? November. Six months later, I had to go to them, ask them, and then they said, okay, cool, we'll lend it to you for a week, but then please return it back. I'm not saying that they have any obligation to send me a phone. I'm grateful whenever someone does, it's really appreciated. But if this company wants mainstream appeal, they've got to adapt to this new age of media. And compare that to OnePlus, who will send out phones two weeks before launch. They'll give you a guide that explains all the new features, and they'll let me keep the phones as long as I need them to test. This is a world apart. If you've ever wondered why I don't cover as many LG and Sony phones, this is a big part of the reason. Sometimes I'll try and buy them myself, but even then I'll often get them a month after some reviewers in the US do. So it's tough to really justify making a full video about it at that point. So yeah, I'm giving Sony a prestigious 9 out of 10 award. Because, yes, even though other companies have had bigger monetary losses, I don't think any company that I can think of has had a more continuous lapse in judgment. Anyways, if you enjoyed this video, a sub to the channel would be incredible. Thanks to Sony for sponsoring this video. Joke. And um, I'll catch you in the next one.